Welcome back to Mages and Murder Dads, the show where we play and talk about the games beyond Baldur's Gate. I am Cameron. And I'm Danny. Playing Icewind Dale. This is our fourth episode on Icewind Dale. Uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, plot summary in just a bit. I, you know, I will say we recorded, you know, the idea with these seasons for us is... Do it all at all. once. Ma- marathon it. Yeah, yes, we do it all in one day. Mm-hmm. No, we we record them all, and then we release them, you know, in, in their bi-weekly yeah. format, because, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to get our recording together, and so we don't want to be on, uh, on that tight timeline clock. You know, we want to be prepared ahead of time, and uh, that's, a, that's a big benefit for these episodes, because we recorded, I believe, the third episode on Icewind Dale in October. <laughs> And it is now currently the next January. year. <laughs> it's the next year. So uh, big benefit for us uh, recording. But for you, seamless. But a little bit behind the curtain here. Uh, what happened? What's happened so far in the plot? Why don't you give us the good old-fashioned Danny's plot summary? Hashtag Danny's plot summary. Oh, my God. So I have a confession to make. It We haven't recorded mm-hmm. since October. I recorded all of my footage. In October. For this episode. For this episode in October. Uh-huh. Like a and solid... you went back and reviewed it. I reviewed this episode. Yes. I have not reviewed the overarching plot of this game. Uh-huh. Well, do, so, okay. So what you, do you remember... We've got a little bit happened. of a... Yeah, this is a challenge plot summary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I don't... And this is one thing I think <laughs> I shared with you. I said, if we were going to do this with any other game, this would be bad news. Yeah, it would be a problem. But, <laughs> but for this game, not really a problem. I think I can I think I might have the recall. We are we you play a big old troop of adventurers. Mm-hmm. Initially I played a solo Balthazar, but by the time I got to like a couple chapters in, I had to switch stuff. So I'm gonna retcon the solo Balthazar that was just a that was just a bad dream. Mm-hmm. Um, Balthazar is slowly um like transforming. He's like in his college years now. He's beginning to realize, oh my God, do I live in a society? Are there other, like, is solipsism wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Balthazar's undergoing some real changes. Uh, you're a troop of adventurers in, oh, one of the 10 towns, Koldahar? No, you're in like, a, you're <laughs> you start in this one place and there is mm-hmm. a jerk there. And he's like, we're, we're going on a caravan trip. You'd better come along with us. And you yep. do. And there's an avalanche. And everyone dies except your little group. Uh, you make it to Koldahar. There's a fun druid there. The druid says bad things have been happening. He tells you to go investigate. You investigate. Those things utterly unrelated to, to, what, to what the <laughs> supposed bad things are. You come mm-hmm. back. The druid's like, actually, I was just messing with you earlier about maybe those other things being related. Really, what you need is to get this MacGuffin. You need to go to a special place and take the MacGuffin. You go to the place with the MacGuffin. It's not actually there. You come back to the druid. The druid says, oh, you know what? Based on a, you know, a hobbit lay here, based on this drop of poison somewhere... You need to go uh, Go to these mountains. You go to the mountains. You fight like a forgotten deity in the hardest fight in the game. Oh, yeah, that was hard. Mm-hmm. You take a MacGuffin. You come back to the druid. Turns out that druid was not the druid the whole time. He was just posing as the druid. Mm-hmm. And he's like, aha, now that I have this special thing, you're never going to stop me. Who? Oh. And then he leaves. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the thing. I do not remember how the plot gets us to the severed hand. You go upstairs. Oh, you go upstairs. You find the real druid. Yeah, he's been dying there the whole, the whole time. time. <laughs> he's just... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and he it- says, uh, boy, you really messed up because now... All kinds of bad things are going to happen because of what you've done. 
Um, and with his last words, I guess he tells you you should go to the place, the Tower of the Severed Hand, for reasons. You remember mm-hmm. those reasons? Uh, you've got some stone that will allow you to, I don't remember, it's like the heart stone, maybe? You've got that, and and there is a, a uh, there was once an elven sorcerer mm-hmm. in the keep of the severed hand mm-hmm. who could use their powers and abilities in order to find the heart of something. Yeah, that sounds right. So the evil yeah. druid didn't take the heart, huh? No, he did. You're trying to. You're looking for it. Hold ah. on. Hold on. <laughs> Let's see. This dude's name is. I, I should have also. Uh, done this here. All right, so let's do, uh, we're pulling up sor- sorcerers.net. I pull up sorcerers.net. Everyone's most important uh, uh, thing. All right, so his name is Arendelle. Mm hmm. I- Icewindale. I'm Googling. Okay. Boop, 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 boop. I found a fandom.com. Not helpful. Greg, Arundel. Oh, Baldur's Gate 2 has a staff of Arundel. Did you know that? Oh, that's a nice little tie-in, huh? Yeah. Gosh, I am going to have to go to sorcerers.net. All right, so sorcerers.net. Uh, Icewind Dale. Walkthrough. Sorcerers. Sorcerers place. All right. I'll edit some of this out. Mm-hmm. All right. The fi- oh, I should have bought the official strategy guide. Oh, we would have had time for it to ship from Australia. You think that's where it's from? Probably. Okay. Download. Why is this not on the... Why do I have to download it? Uh, do you want me to link... Yeah, I'm, I, I, the thing is, it's interesting because the thing I'm linking you right now is like, is it's called, it's entitled Icewind Dale Solution by Silvis Moonbow. Oh, okay. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. I see. All right. Chapter three. But I don't think it has a specific um, like re- reason why you get diverted to the severed hand. It doesn't. Yeah. It's not a part of the solution. You don't need it to solve the game. (laughs) (laughs) The Hearthstone gem which brought you originally. So what does that guy steal from us? Hold on. Jesus Christ. Icewind Dale plot. Here we go. Just the Wikipedia article, right? Okay. Um, I don't think it's going to be there, unfortunately. Uh, they eventually find the gem being used by a powerful Marilith. I remember that. After killing Yuxaname and retrieving the gem, the party returned to Koldahar under attack by Orogs, an Arendelle mm-hmm. mortally wounded by a shapeshifter disguised as the Archdruid who taunts before vanishing. The true Arendelle advises the party to take the Heartstone to Laryl at the forces of the Severed Hand. We do have the Heartstone. Mm, the, okay. what, the reason why um, that shapeshifter... Uh, like had us mm-hmm. go take out Yuxaname is because Yuxaname is just like uh, his nemesis. So I don't think that the Hearthstone gem was actually the important thing. It was just killing Yuxaname. Mm, that makes sense. Okay, now we're all caught up. We're all caught up. Well, what'd you do? Well, I want to begin this podcast. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, I, uh, spoilers, we've already begun the podcast. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. No. We've been going for like eight full minutes now. I'm, I just want to get something out of the way. Okay. Are we talking about combat in this episode? You're asking if we're talking about practice? I'm talking about praxis. Oh, I see. Uh, I mean, is the word, I don't, what are you asking me? I don't think that there's. I feel like any, I'm being tricked. Yeah, you're not. This is I, this is the problem with uh, mm. my perpetual sarcasm and nonsense, and also with the questions you ask. With me. the questions I ask, and um, mm-hmm. just the the way in which I meddle in your affairs, mm-hmm. the riddles let I me, pose let to me, you. Let me give a a good example of this. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, 
our good friend Danny, mm -hmm. sends me a message that says, I just heard <laughs> I'm here if you need to talk. And that this could be anything. It really could. Th someone could be perished. Mm -hmm. uh, I The stock market could be crashing, and I just wasn't aware of it because mm -hmm. I was like in the middle of doing something. You send it to me, and then stone nothing for a solid two minutes. Absolutely nothing. And I send you a message. I say, hey, what are you talking about? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Is this a bit? Are you doing a bit to me, or are you not doing a bit to me? And then you link to me that some goddamn comic book movie had been Morbius. Had been Morbius delayed. has been delayed once again. Ah, Morbius has been delayed. Probably people are hearing this when Morbius is out. No, probably not. <laughs> it, it's probably done. But mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, your scampery is well noted mm -hmm. and known mm -hmm. and unpredictable to the point where sometimes I tell you during a you know during a streaming marathon, mm -hmm. take off all of your clothes. And jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're like, no. And you're saving repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, you're entitling those saves before I abandon <laughs> my armor. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But no, sometimes I, I, I am 100% honest. This is genuine. Uh, I, I just wanted to get it out in front. Uh huh. Is any of the combat that we experienced in this chapter notable? Is it worth talking about? Mm -hmm. If so, let's go ahead and get it out of the way. <laughs> Yeah, sure. uh, yeah, yes, okay. I will say. Yeah, probably. Yeah, well, let's talk about that then. Um, well, because I am currently at a level now where my spellcasters are like wrecking house. Yes, same. So it really kind of changes everything up. And uh, the melee characters, they, what they are up to is different now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, their capacity to survive getting fireballed in the front line <laughs> alongside all the enemies is just as important uh, important as their like DPS. And the game at this point is like handing out upgrades like candy. Oh, absolutely. Th I think that that's kind of mechanically what's going on here is severed hand is, hey, just in case you missed some magic weapons <laughs> in Yuxaname's lair, let's uh let's make sure you pick those up now. Mm -hmm. Here's a couple plus 2 ones, you know, it, plus 1's minimum at mm -hmm. this point. Uh, weirdly enough, in this section, I did not have as many, you know, it's been a minute, but but I remember the last section having quite a few enemies, and the one before that having enemies where um, having magic weapons of a certain, you know, threshold, of a certain capability was really important, right? So, like, the shadows and then uh, maybe some of the magic creatures. Oh, Yuxanime herself, right, required a... Magic weapon plus, to damage. Yeah, plus two, maybe? Plus yes. one, something like that? Pretty it was a, a simple plus one was insufficient, which is mm -hmm. one of the reasons why at the point where you're fighting Yuxanime, uh, that's a very challenging fight, just because not all of your party will even be able to like meaningfully participate. You've really got to find some, find some, uh, you know, utility roles for people to play if they don't have mm -hmm. a plus two. And so, but in this one, I didn't really run into any of that. You know, I didn't run into any enemies where I had to work through some new way of, you know, engaging them or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is interesting because I kind of thought that would kind of be a part of the game going forward that occasionally you'd run into creatures that you had a hard time dealing with. But th I, I will say this, uh, the, the way that the severed hand section, you know, this, this fortress we're going to, the way that the combat works here is that rather than giving you four or five enemies that require some like weird thing to do to hit them, mm -hmm. uh, they just start increasing the count yes. of enemies, which, you know, I, I'll say this, you know, this is based on what, 2.5 basically, kind yes. of, um, uh, second edition with some augmentations and the enhanced editions have some third edition rules that are optional. Um, and I, but I'm not using any of that. It is notable to me that this edition of D&D &D kind of combat and 5th edition kind of work the same way, which is that at this level, because all of my people are like 7, 8, 9, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. At this level, really, it's like either you have two or three really strong enemies that are just going to knock the shit out of you, or you have a load of very easy to deal with enemies, but there's just a lot of them. And the number itself is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's interesting that there's a kind of convergence. I wonder, I'm sure there's like some interesting math graph to show this, but, you know, somewhere around level eight in D&D, &D, 
uh, combat design in particular, there's a kind of like bifurcation of methods. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it becomes really difficult to, or it seems like it becomes difficult to balance encounters in a game where combat is your primary, um, you know, and, and video gaming style combat is your primary way of, of dealing with encounters. Because like in the real world or like in actual tabletop uh, role playing games, this is about the level where puzzle solving or figuring out ways to augment the battlefield mm -hmm. or, or how to take a fight or, you know, thinking conspiratorially and thing and like getting allies in the world and things like that. This is a good place. I think, you know, level seven, eight, nine for that to kind of kick in where the cool part of combat is you using all your skills and abilities that are not combat related to, you know, figure out how to maneuver in the world. In a video game, obviously, or a video game, this video game, I'll say, because Baldur's Gate 3 seems to be playing with some of that, but this video game, when it comes out, with its kind of capabilities and its its interests, doesn't really have that going on. So, um, yeah, anyway. And also, the one additional thing I'll say is mm -hmm. that in a uh, tabletop game, you can still do the thing at this level where it's like, hey, there's just like one or two or three really big enemies and they hit really hard and they're going to knock you down and you're going to have to figure that out. In a video game, it's not cool to have enemies, like one or two big enemies just run into you and one shot all of your characters one after the other. Um, you know, that's like deeply unengaging. So there's something going on here about the video game form that determines a particular kind of D and D design that's going on here. Um, but I say all that to say I resolved 90% of the encounters here by either abusing the, uh, the stairway, the stairwell, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, mechanic, you know, uh, listeners to uh, to too much future will remember, uh, my, uh, casino, uh, experience of going up and down the stairs and resting for a full month. Um, very similar kind of scenario going on here. Um, but you can make people, you can make enemies follow you up and down stairwells mm -hmm. and that breaks their like positioning. So if you go up a stairwell and you see like, you know, you're surrounded by archers, just go right back down the stairs. They all come down the stairs. They spawn right in front of you. You can hit them. The advantage that they have gained, uh, from that, uh, from positioning is nullified. So I used that to, to deal with quite a few encounters, and then the rest of the encounters that were in particular rooms or whatever, I just put my two mages somewhere there and skull-trapped and fireballed into the room, mm. and then that softened everyone up. So very similar to the way that I played Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 at this point. Yeah, following up on just specific tactical things, I mm -hmm. think there was maybe one or two fights in here where I needed to reload, um, and it was just because somebody got like some unlucky rolls thrown against mm -hmm. them but i'm not in the skull trap uh i'm not particularly in the skull trap or fireball cheese and to be honest i don't think i use the stair cheese very much i think that the way my party is constructed right now uh i can just chew through through things with haste and mm -hmm. like a fully buffed party so efficiently that the uh that the, this level in particular, this chapter isn't keeping up and dovetailing off of some of the game design, um, game design uh, observations you made. I would say that this is a, we've basically gotten two extremes in terms of the Oxaname fight to this. And I do think it is about that bifurcation you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I would certainly argue that because of the way 2.5 works, and specifically because of the way it's implemented in this these CRPGs, right? Where it's not really rounds. It's like things are just on timers. Um, but due to the fact that the way, due to the way that armor works, and everything is very binary in D and D for the most part, there aren't generally um, generally you're not seeing a lot of like partial successes on attacks. Uh, those kind of effects. Mm. I just find this design mode where let's just throw more lower level enemies at you. Uh, it's incredibly easy compared to let's throw one much higher level enemy at you. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing both sides of that. And I think that'll probably come th through in the, in the footage on the YouTube version of this podcast is you're just one, like my, my really cool, 
archer person is just demolishing people because these are low, lower level enemies. It's very easy to hit them. It's very hard for them to hit my people with decent armor class, especially after being buffed. So it's just a very, this is one of the reasons why I kind of pose this is, you know, obviously I played this a while ago. You played it more recently, but as I was looking through the footage, I was like, yeah, there's not a, there's not a standout fight in this chapter that I find like interesting to talk about the tactical, uh, you know, considerations of the fight. It was yeah, very no, much. There's no mm, Yuxaname. No, there's no set level. piece fight, to be honest. Um, you know. he, well, because it's like a big puzzle. Yeah, exactly. You know, puzzle, puzzle. I'm, you know, <laughs> it's in quotation marks. It's, it's the puzzle you're going to get in Icewind Dale. Um, so, yeah. yeah, not, and here's the thing. I think that there was a time when, there was a time when I think Danny would experience a level like this and be deeply disengaged. But, you know, we are 78 episodes into Mages and Murder Dads now. I found this perfectly pleasant. <laughs> You've been bludgeoned into uh, into uh, feeling good about it. Yeah, I thought it was fine. I, you know, I didn't. I don't think this is like a standout level. No. Um, combat wise, I do think level design wise, it's pretty cool. Yes, uh, and I think that narrative wise, it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, combat combat is not. Um, you know. It was a thing to just kind of pass through. It was it was is very much padding. To be honest, it was it was just like yeah. it it padded the time. I think that without combat, you're still going to probably just because of uh, how long it can take your characters to pathfind through the severed hand in particular. I don't know if you found this. The pathfind there is a marked difference. I don't know if it's an enhanced edition thing going on here. I don't know what's I don't know what's up. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this was in the original Icewind Dale. Or if this is a problem, but uh, the pathfinding way worse than the Baldur's Gate games. Yes, and I don't and I don't know why. And it could be that it has to do with like the uh, the level design complication. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's it. I it seems like they're checking positions very differently, uh, but maybe they're not. Maybe that's just pure you know uh, epiphenia. Uh, the other the the other thing that is notable about that is that my party AI keeps breaking. Yes, it just they just don't do anything, and I'll like turn it off and on, and turn it off and on, and turn it off and on. And it doesn't work, and so I am, I don't know, for half of this footage I have, I'm manually having to select every action they do, and when it's just like a bunch of random enemies, I just really want them to auto attack, yeah. right? Like it's not that complicated. I don't need to to manage each of these. But then in some in some parts it's working, mm-hmm. and it seems to have nothing to do with it. I I don't know what's going on, uh, but it it was extremely frustrating. It's not a problem I've had in any of these other games. Yeah, I that is a real bummer because I do think that um, you know I've got some distance. It's been a while since I played, but even when I scrub back through my footage, <laughs> you know my ire is raised slightly because what I end up having to do is there are several party members where I just have to turn it off. They will just do the wrong thing um, Mm -hmm. with it on or not do anything at all or just do things that are actively worse than them doing nothing, Um, especially when it comes to managing special ammunition and things like that. Uh, That can be like testy in in terms of like, okay, spellcaster, please do not willy nilly cast spell spell things. Just use your sling. And yeah, sometimes I just can't get it to work. But uh, yeah, the game would be much more pleasant. (laughs) Um, if, if that did work, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know about the pathfinding. It might be the amount of, like, objects you can manipulate in the level is is, is something. Like, there's just I a lot of, like, idea. random piles of bones and such that you can't walk yeah, through. Yeah, it, it is certainly less, like, big and open and square. Yeah. You know, that uh, Baldur's Gate 2, even the outdoor maps are basically, you know, here's a big set of polygons you cannot, or not polygons, but I guess, like, um, navigable map, uh, you know, green map that you can use and you can't go on red map and like that's just how it is but yeah this has a lot of like you know things they're doing i ended up having really weird slowdown mm. during this session i and i don't know why i mean my, my computer could run 50 copies of ice dale at one time right yeah i you know it is not a resource intensive game and for whatever reason it was like i like occasionally during combat it would get real slow I wasn't sure what was happening. So I something going on a little bit with Icewind Dale in a broad sense, but 
got through it perfectly fine. Uh, yeah. Well, do you want to talk about things that aren't combat then? Yeah, I was just thinking about anything else mechanical that we wanted uh, that we wanted to chat about. But I think that's kind of it as far as uh, as far as we got we got combat. We got some weird. <laughs> weird pathfinding issues etc but mm-hmm. otherwise my experience of this uh of this chapter was just a narrative I- experience which uh i'm gonna, I'm gonna use the the dreaded word a fart that's close that is forbidden mm-hmm. hashtag hold it in for her do we have to introduce a bit when it's the first time it's on like a product line or do we assume everyone is that like a easter egg for deeply enfranchised people? That's yeah, a question. Th- that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yep. Um do you know what's interesting about uh, uh Icewind Dale no Zion National Park? No, no. Anyway, there's some so, sins uh, <laughs> that are just prevented by the coding. Um Exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> they knew they knew it would be a problem. Uh, the, uh, but yeah, well, uh, oh, but no, the, the, the bad word lore. Oh, mm-hmm. there is some lore, big there, lore chapter. It's a game. lore chapter and it is very much a, uh, it's a chapter where you piece together, uh, kind of, uh, the past that led to the tower of the severed hand being in the state that it's in. That's kind of like the way the whole chapter works. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So how do you want to how do you want to start talking about the way the severed hand works narratively? Uh, I don't, well, why don't you start at the beginning? Oh, so the beginning chronologically is, uh, I guess, the Lord, s- Lord Ao. <laughs> oh, yes. Let's let's start from the beginning. Ao, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a thinly veiled hold, Christian hold, hold entity. Wait, wait. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. I want you to tell me, what do you think is the creation myth for the Forgotten Realms? Ooh. Just off the top of your head, because I know you don't know, but just yeah. using your, uh, you know... Uh, just the bits and pieces, the fragments of my yeah. understanding of, like, Forgotten Realms lore. Yep. I think Ao creates the gods. And I think that collaboratively... Ao and the gods create Toril. And Forgotten Realms is obviously like that's a part of Toril. Is that accurate? Or does Ao create mm. Toril on his own? Or on their own? Uh okay. This is from realmshelps.net. <laughs> and it looks like it was made in about 1998. Okay. So you know it's good. Yeah. Uh the history of Faerun began when Lord Ao created the universe that now holds the world of Toril. So Ao, whole universe. Okay. To- Toril planet. Yes. After this creation came a period of timeless nothingness, a misty realm of shadows that existed before light and darkness were separate things. Eventually, this shadowy essence coalesced into to form beautiful twin goddesses. Oh, dragons? Were, mm, no. No. Polar opposites of one another, one dark and one light. I bet you know this. Who are who are the twin goddesses, dark and light? Wait, they're both goddesses. Yep. Mm. Uh, is Saloon one? Uh, yes. Okay. So Saloon's the moon, and the other mm-hmm. one's the other. I can't remember the other name, like the sun goddess Shar. Shar. there we go that, that that's so strange she's the darkness she's not even the sun she's just the darkness oh Shar is the uh, darkness the twin goddesses created the bodies of the heavens giving life to Shantaea the embodiment of the world of Toril mm-hmm. so kind of those three at the beginning mm-hmm. uh, blah 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 they all fight and shit they're all angry at each other um, while the deities battled while these three deities battled um Intelligent beings rose on Toril, and their five original species. Blah blah blah, gods and goddesses, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Gotcha. For some reason, yep. I figured uh, that dragons would be a, uh, play a larger part in like the creation. Not even of, here. Yeah. No. I, well, I think that that's that's part of uh, making sure that the Forgotten Realms is very distinct from Dragonlance. Yeah. Also, kind of becoming a big thing in the eighties. Mm-hmm. It really could have gone either way, huh? 
It really could not if you know about Dragon Lance. Dragon Lance is so bizarre and weird that I think it's impossible for it to be like a standard setting. Interesting. So basically, Baldur's Gate was bl- bland enough to be the yes. flagship. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, Forgotten Realms was bland enough. Interesting. Well, also, too, that, uh, uh, what, Wace and Hickman, uh, they are kind of external contractor-y kind of people, mm-hmm. and uh, D&D, and I think that Dragonlance, I believe, I, I, I haven't done my research on this, I believe that Dragonlance originates internal to Wizards of the Coast, whereas Forgotten Realms at Greenwood did a, a whole bunch of work on it, and then um, they bought it. Ah. And so they acquired it very specifically, whereas I believe I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not hundred percent on this, but I believe Dragon Lance is an internal development. And so I, I think that the thing that makes it, um, the generic kind of quality that makes it a thing that's worth acquiring also is the thing that kind of makes it a useful world. But like, yeah, Dragon Lance has got a lot of like weird rules associated with it. Um, you know, like fiction rules and there are no weird fiction rules other than like the spell weave i guess yeah and the spell plague but a lot of that stuff really gets elaborated later on after well they got rid of the spell plague too they like pretended like it never happened. oh did the spell plague just get retconned yeah in like fifth edition i get it like appeared in the past at some point but like you know whatever Mm. there's like chaos magic zones i think still we're a little bit far we're far far afield afield here here. um let's start many ages past let's say not maybe not at the beginning but many ages past there's a there's this beautiful tower made by the elves it's uh right in the spine of the world and it's right it's a it's a real middle finger to all the orcish and orcish folk and goblin folk around Mm -hmm. and uh it's chilling out there and eventually orcs and goblins besiege it and i guess despite the fact that it was just here chilling out for ostensibly quite some time there was not really adequate defenses um erected to like protect this tower uh that's kind of shaped in a like a hand i imagine and uh so as a last it's like one last hope. This guy, Laryl, who's kind of the the head mage here, uses some kind of magical spell or incantation or ritual in an attempt to save everybody. But boy, howdy, do things go wrong uh, with, with this big spell. And now uh, we got a bunch of, uh, you know, shadows, undead, skeletons, um chilling out here and i think that this Mm -hmm. is like it basically protected everybody by by turning a lot of folks undead this is my my take here Ooh, that's not what happened is it not no i learned some lore you didn't learn any lore i mean i learned the lore i'm literally reading the summary on the uh on sorcerers.net oh that's not what happened so well that's not what uh larry tells us when we get there gotcha so yeah, so they're all getting their asses kicked by orcs and goblins, mm-hmm. and their last ditch is like, we're going to summon this mythal. Yeah. And the mythal, um, I believe the mythal is also what's going on with Mithdranor, right? Yes. That's, that's why it's like, it's basically, a mythal is basically the zone from uh, Stalker. Mm-hmm. It's like a, an entity that like you can't communicate with, but is living and is like doing stuff all the time. And in Mithranor, I believe that's the thing that's like summoning portals for demons and shit and all kinds of stuff like that. Yes, it's like fighting against it. I don't know if that's one hundred percent true, but feels true to me. Uh, but so what happens is that uh, Laryl summons the Mythal, and it's like going, and then he looks over, and I, I wrote the name down. I got to write down the Enoth. He had a first name, and I forgot to... Like, uh, Carol Enoth. Yeah. He's standing there, and he's the elf god of time. Okay. And he's looking at him, and he's pissed off. So the mythal, like, it goes off, but this is... The way that you're explaining it, which is, like, a fair uh, explanation, is, like, the mythal happens, and the, like, guidelines are wrong. And so it protects everyone by, like, you know, doing all this undead shit. Yeah. That's that, But that is not how it is explained to me. In my game, it is that... And this is straight from God. Laryl himself, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is what Laryl says. Okay. And he says that the elf god, basically, as the spell goes off, that this elf god perverts the spell. So there's not a mythal here. There's just some other evil shit going on. Oh, and it's just hubris. As punishment for hubris. Exactly, of hubris. There's the, and it's basically like a, like a, a curse now. 
Um, and the <laughs> it's really funny after you like do all the things for Laryl, and you're like, hey, if we resolved all this, why are you still here? And he's like, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Interesting. I, I I do think that Laryl uh, does have some some material like motivation to say, oh, this wasn't this wasn't my spell. It was it was <laughs> some wrathful god did this. I did everything. Well, perfect. no, he owns it as the spell, but he just says like the spell goes off, and instead of the intended outcome, mm-hmm. the the elf god punished him. Mm-hmm. You know, by perverting the spell and turning it into something else. I'm just not sure that the mythal went off is my, my point of disagreement. Mm-hmm. I, I think that maybe all that spell energy produced some other thing. Gotcha. Uh, it was it was misdirected incorrectly. Y- yeah. Mm-hmm. By Elf God. Gotcha. As opposed to like, I, you know, the Resident Evil, I created a cure for cancer that turns people into zombies. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, understood. Yeah, so... In any case, a bad thing happened, and mm-hmm. that we are we are left with uh, the tower of the severed hand. Now, I guess the notable thing about its construction is you walk in and you're basically like in the wrist, right, of this e- of this tower. Oh, is it an actual? It is an actual hand. Yeah. Oh. Or you're either in the I mean, wrist think about or like it. the bottom of the palm of the hand. If you can imagine yeah. a hand, uh, palm up with its fingers kind of curled upwards, right? Mm. Um, you walk into the base of the hand and there are these towers and, and a, kind of a tower for each finger. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's different stuff in all of the fingers. And ultimately, <laughs> you can kind of do it in whatever order you want but ultimately in order to like progress the chapter you're gonna have to get to the top of like the tallest finger is <laughs> what what ultimately probably the index mm-hmm. finger i imagine the bird finger the bird oh the, the, oh yeah the bird finger and um i like that you just said the index finger i imagine like you've never seen a hand before well, I don't know the orientation of the like. I, I, I yeah. Like, well, they're all kind of equidistant, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't. <laughs> it's uh, you know, I, I think that um, this this tower looks uh, the experience of this tower is a lot different if it were a uh, I don't know like a Skyrim DLC, right? Mm-hmm. It's gonna gonna definitely have a different feel to it, but it's a little bit abstracted here. But anyway, the the whole experience is going to like bottleneck into you need to get these like parts of an astrolabe and some special ingredients in order to like in order to get Laryl to uh, plot dump you and direct you to the next area so that's basically it right Mm -hmm. yeah so what kind of little quests were there here to do um there's a quest from I'm looking for some names here. We've got a uh, uh, Denani. Denani is the priest. Yeah, looking for holy water. Uh huh. And this is the thing. <laughs> this is the thing. Well, I'm, she's looking. Wait, Denani is just looking for you to kill all the other priests. I ended up with the holy water, and she didn't care about it. Oh, interesting. I yeah. did, I think I did get a, a, a reward for um, the. Oh, I want. Did you kill the people before talking to Denani? Nope. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, Because that was kind of two quests. So there is, there's like a warrior and a priest in there. So it's Denaini and uh, Kalesa. And and they kind of have mirror quests. It's just, hey, there's a bunch of, you know, my old buddies, the old priests or the old fighters, if you you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, killing them, laying Mm -hmm. them to rest, let's say. Sure. Uh, And you do those things and you get... Our reward. Yep. And uh, there's uh, a guy who... Oh, what's it? Uh, Velestus. Is that Vel- in the Arboretum? Um, yes, in, in the garden. He's oh, looking yeah, yeah. for pure water, an animal, and a seed. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't have any of that none stuff. None of this stuff is uh, gettable, until you get to later chapters. You've got to get to Great. chapter five and chapter six to get this stuff. Oh, you know what? We didn't talk about uh, the Laryl killing a squirrel at the very beginning of this thing. That happens at the beginning, just outside. 
Yeah. As they, you, as like, you like, approach the tower. There's a squirrel standing there, and you get a, a little thing, and Laryl comes out, and he's like, Big on, foul dwarf! And he's talking to the squirrels. You can see, you can see, they're a little bit kooky up here mm-hmm. in the hand, is what you're telling me. Uh, We're just but, built but, different here in the power towers. <laughs> every day. Anyway, there's a bunch of other named people. Mm-hmm. There's like a child whose mother is dead, who's like a ghost. They're all ghost people. Mm-hmm. There's a bard named Valestus. Yes. Was that Valestus? No. Valestus is the... Talanus the bard. Yeah. They all have is names or le names. Yeah. Elf, the elf got two names, mm-hmm. but uh, and he'll like tell you what happened there. Uh, there's like a guy you can buy stuff from. He's got a lot of good gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool. You can buy stuff from him, but not super complicated here. the The main quest is, oh, actually, I there's one other guy you can talk to whose name I didn't write down. Who is the uh, the librarian? That you can meet right before you actually meet Laryl. Yes, that's uh, Costantos. Oh, yes, of course, Kostlantos. And you're like, hey, Kostlantos, uh, why are you here doing book stuff? Everyone is dead. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I got books to talk about. I got books to read. He takes his like, job as a librarian incredibly seriously. He does. <laughs> I, I did like, enjoy talking to him. But no, I think that uh, we're not we're not going super granular here, in part because really I think that the most generous I could like interpret this chapter is it's a bit of a mosaic. There are little bit characters here and there. They paint a larger picture of a history of like the tower and what happened. But this is completely removed from the plot of this game. Like the tower, the tower could have been anything. The only reason we're here is because uh, the mage here um is is the only person that would be able to point us to the next thing. So this this just feels like a bit of a bottle episode or something. I'm probably misusing that. I mean, what's what's cool about it is the storytelling thing because what you find out, right? I mean, one that mythal thing and him being cursed by elf god. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think that's cool to like get pieced out to you bit by bit. Mm-hmm. You know, and this idea that these elves have been, or, you know, they were in this. Uh, fortress for a really long time and there were just waves and waves and waves of orcs and goblins attacking them and this was kind of their last ditch effort. That's pretty good, mm-hmm. although kind of generic fantasy, right? Very you much know, so. I don't, I don't think anything to write, write home about in a un- unique way. What what I do think is cool is like the elf dwarf thing going on here. Uh, did you did you pick up that? I did about- pick, up, pick up something about that Was and it was... Um- I think that, so there was, like, diplomatic relations between the elves and dwarves that broke down, like, before the siege, and it had to do with some valuable item. Am am I completely off base there? Uh, Yes, so the elves and the dwarves, way back in the day, were best friends, and they were making magic items together. That's, like, what they were up to. Sure. And the dwarves at one point, and this is, like, some real, like... Oh, this is Tolkien. uh, (laughs) This is Tolkien, right? This is like Tolkien's like weird anti-Semitism that's baked into the dwarves. Yes. You can listen to us, uh, to Michael and I in uh, Game Study Study Buddies on uh, the most recent one that we did as of this recording um, on Michael Saylor's As If to hear us talk about kind of Tolkien's relationship to anti-Semitism. I have listened to uh, this. It's a very good episode. And guess what? Sometimes uh, it's insufficient to say, oh, well, you're just not reading it hard enough if, you, if, you, if you're noticing anti-Semitism. Well, no, Tolkien's move is so much worse than that, yeah. right? Tolkien, Tolkien's move, or, I mean, worse, I don't know, who knows worse? It, it ends up in a bad space, right? Yeah. According to the book. Mm-hmm. Again, you can go and listen to the episode. Check that out at rangetouch.com. In any case, uh, super Tolkien scenario, and yes, it was over exactly. a necklace, right? Well, no, it was over a bunch of stuff. So oh, a bunch of stuff. The, so, so the dwarves say, hey, we're making all these magic items. Let's sell some magic items. Mm. Like, let's get going. And the uh, and the guys, are the elves are like, yeah, we're not going to do that because humans should not have access to this stuff. And what ends up occurring is that, lo and behold, all the goblins and the orcs show up. And the goblins and the orcs, they've got magic weapons. Mm-hmm. And so the elves say, oh, shit, the dwarves are... are arming the orcs and goblins to attack us in order to, you know, make us do what they want. And so they're like dead son on betrayal. And that betrayal, they believe is entirely predicated on greed. 
and uh, they kind of go to the mat on that one. Um, I don't think it works out for them. It well, I you know I don't know. Do you want to live forever? <laughs> Not like this. Okay. Everybody well, here important. is bored out of their mind except the librarian. They're so bored. <laughs> yeah, they don't have it. Well, what do they have to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, it's true, but, and I think that uh, guess what? It kind of translates into the gameplay experience that the librarian's probably the most notable. <laughs> the librarian and the big revelation from Latris, obviously, but. Otherwise, you don't, you know, if you populate a game with the people with like people deeply bored out of their minds from having to spend eternity here, it's not super memorable as a player. Like, I think you've mm-hmm. really got to do some extra stuff to to make it like a memorable play experience. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because there's just not all that much else going on because like uh, none of the, the characters we talk to like other than boy i wish my buddies uh who have who are so undead they've like lost all remnants of their humanity i wish somebody put their rest that's like the only desires happening here like well it's just because characters are in nice when dale aren't characters yeah I mean, they're the, you know they're just people to 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 say one or two informative sentences, and that's been the case throughout the whole game so far. Yeah. Right? They're just they don't have desires. Mm-hmm. Uh, the most developed character is the evil <laughs> fake druid. That's true. That's true. Uh, but I will say the difference between uh, it's almost like the uh, the the um, oh gosh, I've forgotten the name of the location featured in chapter two. Let me let me. <laughs> Let me scroll back here. Do, 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 do. Dragon's Eye. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that um, all of those like lizard people attacking you have uh, are just as like dynamic characters as any of the people you're talking to in Chapter Three. Well, yeah, but, and in that place, it was like, hey, uh, you could, for all of them, right? I, if, if I'm remembering correctly, I was like, hey, I don't want to kill you or anything. I'm just trying to look for this thing, and they would be like, I'm killing you now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. So. So very similar, uh, although the, most of those were just the prelude to a combat encounter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I like the little fetch questy narrative thing here, or fetch questy thing, because uh, Laryl is basically there's like a there's a curse that's put on him individually that he's you know destined to be fantasy mad mm-hmm. until the astrolabe, which he and the other mages would use to like look at the world, you know, their device for like divining things. He's he's cursed. He can't do anything. You know, he can't. Uh, I, I I don't know. He can't think. I mean, it's fantasy madness, right? Sure. It's whatever. But he cannot respond to you in a way that seems like he is even engaging with you or knows you are there without repairing the astrolabe. So you got to like go all throughout the whole place and loot every container in the world. Every <laughs> container, which I think the this is one of the reasons why you get so geared up here because you can't skip anything. Yeah. yeah. It's just in a yeah. random box, if I recall. Yeah, you're going to... Uh, they're all in, like, random spots. None of them are on bodies, I don't mm-hmm, think. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, maybe maybe <laughs> the the warrior who you have to kill. Maybe it's on her body. But, uh, yeah, so you got to run around and get this, and then you get to talk to him. You get, like, a pretty good little story. I do like the way this is designed, which is that you have to go up and then back down. Yes. Um, you know, it, you, the the first couple levels are split in the middle, so you actually have to, like... Do this kind of arc that turns it into progressively uh, more constrained encounters. I thought that was pretty cool as far as level design is concerned. But uh, other than that, that's kind of what's going on here. That's the whole thing. I do remember long ago when I told you, yeah, the severed hands, it's nine levels. I think mm-hmm. your jaw dropped because you were thinking, what if these are the same like size of a level as the dragon's eye levels? Which... Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one one or one and a half levels of Dragon Eye is like the same square footage as the entire Tower of the Severed Hand. Yeah, probably. Yeah, um, and also the fights. Uh, there is there are no fights in this chapter as difficult as the last screen of Dragon's Eye. I would say. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, not not a ton of. Not a ton of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, next, uh, lo and behold, we learned all about uh, these evil dwarves and how bad they are, and uh, we're going there next. 
<laughs> it's it's true. So I think that uh, I bet we're going to hear another side of this story. You think? I bet. I, so. so the question is, how many dwarves are we going to kill before we hear the other side of the story? <laughs> well, I think that they're probably like cursed and gone and abandoned too. Mm. So I do. That's just a gut feeling. I don't know. If I do true, think that's you get, you had a pretty good guess um, at the end of uh, last episode when I asked you what mm-hmm. kind of things are we going to mm-hmm. be fighting in this chapter, and I believe you you mentioned some undead things, mm-hmm. in which that's a home run. That's right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So here's the question. What are we fighting in Dorn's Deep? Elementals. Okay, we got elementals. Give me two more. Umber Hulks. Umber Hulks. Oh, interesting. Okay. Drow. Drow. Okay. So you're really you're you're really going literal on the deep. You think that we're gonna be heading yeah, dwarves don't live in airy towers in the trees. They live under the ground. Sure. And I don't think the dwarves will be there. I don't think we're going to have to kill a bunch of dwarves. Okay. So we, we, I we think will it's going to be similar other... to all these other places where someone has moved in who doesn't belong there and we got to kill them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we will get the other side of the dwarf story, perhaps, but not from them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. We will, we will also feel sorry for them because they have also met an ill end. Yes. Mm-hmm. And a ghost will explain to us that they didn't really betray anybody. Ooh, that's that's the cold shot there. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, what are you hoping in terms of are you do, are you wanting another chapter two? Are you wanting another Dragon's Eye? <laughs> would you be happy if the rest of the game were were like the severed hand? Are you like I, what? What are you? I would like all the levels to be progressively shorter. Okay. And I feel like that's not going to happen. Mm. Yeah. Oh, also, at the very end of this, uh, very funny, mm-hmm. uh, you can talk to uh, L- Larry, and he's like, hey, I'll teleport you right to Dorne's Deep. And I said, actually, I need to, I'd need i like to go back to Kuldahar first, you know, to get rid of all this garbage I have. Yeah. And he, uh, there, there's like no animation or anything. You just zip, you just appear there. Oh, like wow. Like a console commanded your way there. Now, when you want to go to Dorne's Deep, would you have to travel up to the top of the tower to get him to teleport? Or is Dorne's Deep no. like a, a... No, it's on your map now. He's like, I'll add it to your map and I'll, I can teleport you there. Or blah, blah, blah. Well. And I said, blah, blah, blah. That's a, that's a favor these games usually do not give you, <laughs> to be honest. No, I thought I was going to have to walk all the way back. Mm-hmm. But... Um, yeah, I've, I, I have a feeling that chapter three might be the briefest uh, chapter from here on out. Um, Heck, yeah. how many are there, six? There are six, six chapters. chapters, yeah. Okay, well, we're on chapter four. Mm-hmm. Yeehaw. All right, well, that's the end of this episode. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with more Icewind Dale. Let's do it. Dorn's Deep. Yeah, Dorn's Deep. Ciao. Chaos will be stolen from the